Well, thank you, uh, Meninder and Linda, and good morning to everyone. I hope you're all doing really well today. You know, I'm always glad uh, to be in the presence of an esteemed bunch of soil geeks like myself. So uh, welcome, and I hope that you learn something uh, from our talk today. I'm uh, not necessarily looking forward uh, to the Q&A answer, but um, go ahead and bring them on and uh, we'll play Stump the Expert and uh, hopefully we'll enjoy that experience as well. So your time is valuable and I'm gonna jump right in and I thought we'd start with a few calisthenics for the brain and you know some nuggets that will get the brain ready to digest uh, the content that I'm gonna download to you all this morning. So I'm gonna run past uh, you some of my high schoolers uh, trigonometry homework problems from last night that she asked me to help her with. No, I'm just kidding. We're gonna jump right in with some calisthenics for the brain with some fun facts about soil and then we'll get, get on with our show. So the first fun fact that I wanna share with you is here on the screen. Did you know that there are 125 million synapses in the average brain? And since of course we're not talking about average brains here, you guys got more, I guarantee it. But the, the fun fact is, is that that's equivalent to the sum of the stars in 150 Milky Way galaxies. So we got a lot going on upstairs and hopefully we'll be able to engage some of that today. Another fun fact, a square mile of fertile farm soil contains more insects than there are humans on earth. Several billion individual organisms can live in a teaspoon of soil. You probably have heard that one before if you've been around uh, talks about soils in the past. But did you know that uh, between 100 million and 1 billion of them are just bacteria themselves? The weight of all the bacteria in one acre of soil is equal to the weight of uh, two cow-calf pairs. So that's pushing over a ton of bacteria per one acre of soil. So these are the kinds of critters that we have uh, living in our soil. And it, it's not so much the name that matters, it's just the broad categories of organisms representing the visible and the invisible soil workforce. Uh, so listing them all is gonna be impossible. It'd be kind of death by PowerPoint. But the key message that I wanna share with you as I throw some of these uh, names of the critters that are in our soil food web out at you is that when left completely unsupervised, these are the, uh, these are the organisms that um, are our workforce in the soil. They're the systematically uh, working through their own individual jobs and collectively efficiently managing the soil ecosystem as a whole. And that's gonna be the, one of the big themes throughout the, this morning's presentation. So what do these, uh, these soil buggers really do? Well, there's, there's six major functions that we can list, uh, starting with the manufacture and transfer of energy within the, the ecosystem of the soil. Uh, their job also is, of course, to eat, uh, process, and dispose of the waste associated with uh, carbon biomass. Uh, they are mobilizing and demobilizing chemical constituents uh, within the soil in the act of their metabolism of those constituents. They're building and maintaining their soil house. They're no different than we are. Uh, they need to have a house that suits their needs. And so they're always working to maintain and build that uh, so that they can function at optimal levels. Of course, they're subject to predator and prey populations. Uh, and so they're not only food for higher organisms, but they also uh, predate on other organisms and maintain populations in that respect. So in their native state, our soils are pretty much self-regulating. And what I mean by that is that the common processes and cycles, the, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, nutrient cycle, uh, predator-prey relationships, these are all more or less optimized in their native state at any given point in time. And that sun, plant, soil life, and soil continuum is maintained in the state that's suitable for the site and the circumstances. Soil life reflects the capacity of the soil and site to function in its place and time. 
uh, introduce a different place or a different time, the function is going to be slightly different due to the natural variability across landscapes. And natural dis disturbances in the concepts that I'm talking about here are the only disturbances. We're actually talking about a time before anthropogenic impacts of any substantial degree uh, that are involved with the ecosystem function. So that means that soils and soil life in their native state from the arthropods to the zooplankton are in a dynamic equilibrium. equilibrium. And the food sources uh, for soil life are not artificially constrained. The habitat requirements for the diverse mix of organisms within the soil environment are essentially intact. Uh, the ecological expression of this really can be re re related to or referred to as a reference state. And those of, who, of you who are familiar with ecological site concepts uh, would understand that term. So let's shift to talking back in the real world rather than the theoretical world. Let's talk about the things that humans really demand of the soils uh, uh, underneath their feet. Uh, there's five functions that soils essentially serve uh, that serves as uh, nutrient cycling and storage sites uh, for carbon, um, major nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and on down the line. Our soils also support um, the physical support of structures, bridges, buildings, uh, farm equipment, uh, all providing that physical support in which we rely upon. Our soils, of course, are uh, biodiversity. They, they serve as a center for the ecology of the soil environment and provide habitat for the organisms that live on and, and in it. Our soils are also uh, you know, very important for filtering mechanisms, not only for uh, water, but also for air in cleaning our environment and getting uh, rid of waste constituents. And then the last is, is the regulation of flow and water through ecological systems. Our, our soils uh, do a very important function in that respect. Well, I bet you can guess from what I've been talking to you about so far and kind of preparing the field of, of the, today's discussion that this is a lot about the microbiology, the, the soil food web underneath your feet, and that we're really relying on them to make sure that our soils are functioning properly. The soil biology or the, the herd of soil life, that underground livestock, is the ones that do the work under our feet that we see expressed in our daily lives. So consciously or otherwise, every one of us, every farmer, every user of our soil environment manages the underground livestock on their land or underneath their feet in some particular way. Regenerative practices in the context of farming then are really all about managing the soil biology, that soil food web, the livestock, and their food supply, their shelter, and their air and water. The simple secret gleaned from hundreds of years of trial and error and understanding of uh, growing understanding about soils is that 90% of the soil functions that I just listed on the previous slide is governed more or less by the soils underneath our feet. That's it. It's, it's really no more or no less simple than that. And so to optimize the soil function, which is the meaning the best we can do for the site and circumstances, the key metric in my mind has always been how do we manage as human beings under the anthropogenic circumstance, how do we manage that invisible soil food web that lives within our soil ecosystem? So it's probably evident to you all by now, by what I'm saying, that over the past 10 slides, you know, I've been trying to build my case here at the start of the discussion today. I'm going to briefly recap again you know, to firmly establish that foundation because I'm going to be relying upon the concepts that I just shared with you in the past 10 minutes or so as I go forward with my view on how soils work. The first here on the screen is that not all soils are created equally. In fact, there's about 24,000 or more different soils 
that are identified by the Natural Resources Conservation Service for our soil survey activities across this nation alone. And all these soils that are created equally, in other words, they're the same soil type or the same soil series, uh, function similarly. But many times the same soils won't function equally or similarly. And these are the circumstances where there's been some kind of alteration in a significant enough way that uh, it manifests itself in the effects of varying use and management over time on the soil biology, on the physical and chemical properties of the soil that then manifests itself in a different functional response. So the key is if you alter the management, the soil and the soil life community, it's going to respond. And if that, if that alteration is significant enough, the soil functioning may change over time. So really the context of us going forward with the rest of the talk is that the food and fiber production and other disturbance regimes that we introduce to our soil environment bring about those physical and chemical changes that precipitate a soil biological response. And that biological response can be one that directly or indirectly affects soil function. In other cases, there may be no response, no significant response to the change given a certain set of circumstances in place. So now I'm gonna to turn to a, uh, a series of YouTube videos. I'll be um, moving in and out of the screen as we're doing these videos. Uh, the first uh, set of videos is gonna be uh, from Arch Ray Archuleta, who some of you may be familiar with as a soil health specialist. He used to work for the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, and he's going to be demonstrating some of these concepts in a practical real world of soil change as a result of soil management. The first clip is going to be about two and a half minutes long, and then I'll come back and uh, segue into the next clip, which will be about three and a half minutes long, and then we'll go from there. So Meninder, I'll stop sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I'll urge everyone to turn the volume up as much as they can. One from the area you do a lot of tillage. In the area you... I think we've lost the sound. from the area you do a lot of tillage. Sorry, I just muted myself. You should be a good one. You collect your soil, one from the area you do a lot of tillage, in the area you don't do a lot of tillage. This particular soil came from uh, Ray Tires farm. He has been doing no-till for 40 years. The only two equipment he runs there is a sprayer or a no-till drill. This one, it comes from a, a neighbor's, same soil type, by the way, and uh, he grows vegetables continuously, year after year after year. That's the major difference between the soil. As you, as you can notice, the color is quite different. This one's darker, this one's lighter. So the way this test works is what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place both these aggregates inside the water. In each aggregate, there's billions and billions of pore spaces. And as I place them in to the water, the water's going to rush in to fill those pore spaces. And we, what we want to see is, will this uh, aggregate hold against those forces and not fall apart? Okay. The contrast here is, notice the jar is clear here. This one is not clear. Notice how the aggregate completely fell apart. 
what this means is the soil pores were no are collapsed on these on this particular aggregate. This ones are still intact. What's so important about that is the more pore spaces you have in the soil system, the better the infiltration. Colors differentiation between the two glass cylinders. One is clear, and one still clouded with suspended plate particles. This one is still clear, and notice the aggregate still intact for the most part. Some of it fell to the bottom, but still a majority of it's still intact. And the reason for that is that a lot of these biological cementing glues are hydrophobic to the water and get into the other part of it together. This one here had very, very little, no cementing agents, no biological glue pulling it. So all of it fell apart and landed up in the bottom of the glass cylinder. Jim, can you share your screen now? Yes, yes, I'll bring it back on. Okay. I use this test, it's called the miniature rain simulator, to build upon the... Okay, I should be back on. Can everyone see my screen now? Yes, Jim, we can. Okay, I'm trying to get it to advance here and... It's not cooperating. There we go. All right. So here's where we're at. So that first two minute clip that you just watched from Ray Archuleta uh, represents perhaps a, a proxy for that steady state condition or reference state that I talked about. In his example, what he is demonstrating is that the uh, soil that had not been tilled, had not been uh, in agricultural production under vegetables for 30 or 40 years, um, more or less is in a state of uh, dynamic equilibrium, like we were talking about. Whereas the other uh, site, obviously the one that's been uh, managed uh, continuously for vegetables, has had a significant effect on the soil biological character and distribution of organisms within the environment. And that has manifested itself not only in the physical changes, but in chemical changes that make it much less stable. It's not in a dynamic equilibrium. It's, it's uh, in a declining state as a result of those impacts of that disturbance. So what we're truly trying to represent here is again, um, imagine your, yourself if you were um, a neighbor to someone who had that nasty exploding clod that uh, Ray demonstrated in, in the video clip. You know, would you consider that your neighbor's soil is functioning uh, properly and is in a, in a state where it's going to be hitting on all cinder, cylinders and doing what you want it to do? Um, you know, how would that how would that field hold up in a rainstorm or a windstorm here in Nevada? Um, so, you know, let's go back to Ray at this point. And there's another video clip from the same video. And um, uh, let's have him talk a little bit more about how it manifests itself uh, on the site and the environment surrounding those fields. Best. It's called the miniature rain simulator to build upon the point of the slate test. The slate test and the rain simulator test are very related. When you have no pore space, you have no infiltration. So, this whole demo will show what happens when you have soil infiltration. So, I collected the soil from a um, uh, conventional till system, agro system, and a no till agro system. The difference in these two systems, this one has not been tilled in 40 years. This one's continually, continuously tilled every every year, no vegetables. Same soil types, but what we want to do is we want to show which one infiltrates first, which one goes through that profile. Notice that the soils are, uh, the jars are plastic jars, yarn jars that filled up a quarter of the way up on both, on both jars. So what we're going to do is we're going to pour this colored water. One is blue, 
and one is red. That's the only, it's just plain colored water. And the only reason I do that is to show the, the water column building up as we pour in. And what we have here is that we have two little plastic containers that are going to simulate the rain. Notice in the no-till system, all the water infiltrated through the whole profile. Notice on this side, the water is still standing up in a column. Notice that in most of our watersheds, we have an infiltration problem, not a runoff problem. And what I mean by that is if we focus on the infiltration problem, soul health, soul function, then we will use, then we will focus on what we have to do to make that soil healthy. Notice in this one, the water will go through the soil and from the soil, it'll go right into the, into the lakes, into the rivers, into the lakes. This one here, the water will sh shut off the land, take all the fertilizer and all the pesticides with it. So this one, notice how it has not infiltrated through. Look at this one. And this, now what causes this is when you create, till, when you do tillage, the zygomycotis bacteria will start breaking down all the glues that hold the particles together, the soil structure together. And the pore spaces collapse. Remember on the slate test, how the soil fell apart? Well, there's no glues to hold the particles together. And this is exactly what happens. There's no pore space. This one has pore space lots and lots of pore space. So it's held in flat by the glues created by all the organisms, soil organisms. This one does not. Uh, the water right here ran off into our rivers and into our lakes. This is to show us what happens when the soils do not function. Our soils have this incredible way of, of working. They not only infiltrate water, but they also capture water because of the organic matter. They, Soils have this incredible ability to filtrate and to capture. Healthy soil systems not only capture and hold water better, but they also allow it to pass through. Pass through. And unhealthy soil systems, that's not what happens. Jim, can you share your screen? Jim, can you share your screen, please? You are muted. Jim? I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, here he is. And I trust you can now hear me. I, I apologize for that disruption. So let's go into presentation mode and we will keep going. We're sorry for the, uh, the video difficulties. We were a little concerned about this um, to begin with. And uh, I understand we're gonna share the clips uh, in the chat so that you can go back and, and watch. Them. And we do have one more segment uh, that will be a continuous clip about four and a half minutes long, and hopefully that will work better. So the two YouTube video clips of Ray Archuleta um, illustrate how soil management directly impacts uh, soil functioning. And I'll turn my screen on here so you can see. Uh, for better and for worse. Uh, these real life scenarios exist across the landscape as I think you all recognize. And they contribute a great deal uh, to where we are with the agricultural systems uh, in the United States and beyond. Uh, recognizing that my talk so far has just touched the surface with regard to how soils work and, and their complexity, 
uh, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to uh, pivot to a discussion on on the key components, the three biological centers uh, of, of soil function uh, within the soil, with a particular focus on activities and actions uh, that disturbance brings to those centers and the effects it has on, on soil biology and the soil processes. So to provide you a reference point for this part of my talk, we're going to as painful as it may be, <laughs> we're going to now turn to a uh, farmer friend of mine uh, named Scott Park. Uh, Scott's, in my experience, probably the single best example of a, a, an individual, a farmer, who understands how soils work. Uh, I met him during my time in California, in Northern California. And this video um, integrates uh, the knowledge of, of soils that we've presented so far and what we're gonna talk about into a, um, a compelling story about his farm operation on 1800 acres of leased ground that occur in Northern California. So we're gonna start this next section out um, with this video. And uh, also following this video, we're gonna do another experiment with you guys. Uh, we're gonna be uh, jumping into a pre-recorded session uh, on how these soils work uh, with a focus on those biological systems. So uh, hang in there and uh, we will turn it back to Meninder uh, again for running that uh, video of Scott Park. Jim, in the meantime, can you add the link to the chat? I did, but I think there might be some advertisement before they actually start watching the video. So if you don't mind sharing the link again in the chat, that would be helpful. And in the meantime, I would start sharing my screen. We'll go from there. I'll go ahead and try to get that in. Okay, thank you. I'm putting the different speaker mode, so please let me know if you can hear better with this. Just give me a thumbs up, otherwise I will switch to the first one. Scott Park of Park Farming has discovered the connection between healthy soils, a healthy and Sutter County, California farm. Was you able to hear? Words were to just an error before this video. Was you Everyone can hear it nicely, very low sound. Okay. I tried to boost up, but let me see if it's 100% here and it's 100% here too. So I will, I will share the link again and hopefully you will be able to watch later on too. That connection benefits both his operation and the local cannery who purchases his processing tomato product. I wish that more of our growers would follow some of Scott's lead in terms of how they pay attention to their soil, testing their soil, and always working to improve uh, the soil base that they have. I started farming in 1974 and farmed uh, totally conventionally was finding that I was having some problems with the uh, soil quality, but I didn't know any different. I thought that's just the way, that's what farming is, and that's the way the situation that I'm dealing with. The fall of 1985, I uh, picked up a piece of ground for tomatoes. It was very close to the other ground I was farming, and the soil was uh, extremely forgiving. We pulled some really big equipment in, expecting to be pulling up boulders to loosen the ground up. And instead, the uh, ripper went through the ground just like through warm butter. And that really made me question my farming practices. And, and through time, I, I became more and more aware of the importance of, of building up the soil and that it would come back in time as all the advantages that I'm seeing. Seeing the value of soil health is, in time has sort of made me create this, this business model but this is profit driven, but the profit is coming from being thoughtful with the soil. All the other falls in place easily. You know, my costs are reasonable because 
uh, of cover costs, you growing cover costs, yeah, there's an initial investment out, but your returns over time more than been compensated, you know, five times over. I, I would hate to give up cover costs. So each part of the facet of all the what I'm doing on taking care of the soil is making me money, and plus it's good for the environment, and I'm making money that I'm passing on to my crew. So a soil health-based management system is going to incorporate four essential principles, and, and they are minimizing soil disturbance, keeping a living root in the soil 24-7, uh, 365, uh, diversification of your crops, and keeping cover on the ground. Scott's management system may not incorporate all four principles at once, but it's the accumulation over the course of a rotation that allows him to be successful with his soil building operation. There's disturbance, but um, it's a practical disturbance. I, I've got a, I've got a growing crop, but I can't, uh, I can't not put this going. Starting with his soil, he builds a very healthy plant. And that, that you have to have that healthy plant to build a good base. Once you have that, then you end up with a plant that can resist diseases and insect pressure a lot. So his fruit tends to be cleaner. He has a better canopy, which will protect against sunburn. And that means overall we have good, clean fruit coming from Scott Park Farm. I'm not trying to get the biggest crop ever grown. What I'm trying to get is a good crop of good quality that, that the canners, they can put up the product they want, and, and I'm not worrying of over-irrigations or of disease from irrigating late. Scott finds a way to be very competitive in his yields, which means he's getting more revenue per acre. In turn, what that means is he and I can negotiate a price that's comfortable for us as well as for him. So he's still making money, and we can make sure that we're offering a product at a competitive price at the grocery store. More of our organic growers who yield uh, much lower, they're requiring us to pay them a lot more to be able to keep them in business. Those growers can't figure out long term how to raise their yields. Then in the end, it becomes economically uh, unviable for us to continue the business. It's a real advantage to have the soil healthy, the root systems deep and strong, nutrients available, you know, because it's not just a water thing. It's it's all the other minerals that are available that are helping that tomato be good quality and not just a, uh, a, red, a red ball of water. Jim, it's your turn now. Back to you. Now I will put the YouTube video link right after this. All right, um, we will now uh, transition to the last part of our show here. And here we go. So let's start by reviewing the foundational drivers of Scott Park's business model. With Scott, there is no soil without plants, no plants without organisms, no organisms without adequate chemical energy habitat, water, and food. You see, Scott trusts that the system nature has created is gonna work for him. He works within that system, making sure to minimize the disruptions to the natural cycles that are already in place. Detritus armors the soil. It controls microclimates, and it provides a fresh source of carbon that keeps the soil engine running. That soil engine is the community of organisms living on and in our soils. Their power is derived from the sun's energy and carbon converting to converted to chemical energy by photosynthesis. And by their segregated work, the community of soil and plant life collaborate to build and maintain their soil environment. And that ensures an ecological steady state where their ability to reproduce is assured. Along the way, the soil life collectively manages populations, cycles nutrients, and creates soil conditions that are conducive to air and water exchange, all for the benefit of the plant. Management of a diverse vegetative community is at the heart of Scott's business model, a 
taking care of the soil so it will take care of him. He's arrived at this destination through his exposure to some of Alan Savory's work on holistic management. In this book, Savory advances the foundational ecological principle that the more diverse a community of organisms in a system, generally the more stable that community or system it is. This holds true for plants, animals, and microbial populations in soil. A highly diversified plant community is quite likely to be optimized given its place and time relative to its potential in any ecological setting. In contrast, high disturbance management systems yield very few of the efficiencies of diverse plant communities. Instead, in my 30 years of experience, it tells me that these systems actually create and magnify disruptions in life-sustaining cycles and feedback loops that are foundational to soil function. In so doing, high disturbance systems such as high tillage environments over the long term are not resilient. They cause a lot of environmental damage, they cost a lot of money, and they produce poor quality food. Other than that, what's not to like about it? Tillage destroys soil surface habitat and the near surface soil aggregates that are home to most members of the soil food chain. Tillage also collapses the soil and makes it less permeable to air and water. There are at least three so-called control points or hotspots within the soil profile where most of the biological activity takes place. The three are at the soil surface, in the soil matrix, and at that root soil interface commonly referred to as the rhizosphere. Let's review what happens at each of these control points as a result of conventional tillage, starting at the soil surface control point and then we'll work our way down. As we all know, the sun is the driving force for all ecosystem functions. Once sunlight is converted into chemical energy, organisms use that energy for metabolism and they give off heat and waste in the process. Plants, of course, are nature's way of doing that important first step of converting light energy into photosynthetic material or chemical energy, which is then used by consumers such as microbes and cattle, humans, and others. The most important job for a grower is actually to capture sun energy efficiently through the use of plants. Bare fields cannot efficiently capture or convert sun energy to useful purposes for obvious reasons. Rather, all that's really captured in a bare field is heat. And heat, without any way to harness, use, or transform it to chemical energy, is the first sign of the disastrous ecological domino effect that tillage has on the soil environment. So what are we left, we left with? We're left with mineral soils without cover that are exposed and subject to wind and water-based erosion. The lack of an armor also mobilizes pore clogging silts and clays that, in the absence of accumulated detritus in the upper part, create soil crusts. These crusts will prevent germination of seeds and make it more difficult for air and water to exchange with the soil matrix. Check this slide out closely, especially the values that are warning signs that heat buildup is starting to shut the soil biology. It's really important to manage for cool soil conditions. A lack of adequate soil cover is the single largest source of loss of soil moisture out of a soil system. And that's an inefficiency that your production, your production system cannot afford to have here in Nevada. With time and experience, your monitoring of soil temperatures can help you calibrate your production model targets for the soil surface temperatures canopy percentages that you know will maintain healthy biological activity throughout the growing season.
loss of the detritus at the soil surface also eliminates habitat for a myriad of diverse macro and microorganisms that are in charge of transforming that detritus into that chemical energy and a supply of nutrients for plant use. This causes the populations of these critters to fall, creating imbalances between plant beneficial organisms and the opportunists that are able to tolerate harsher conditions such as this, but aren't really particularly useful for doing the work that needs to be done. Without the beneficial predators, pests get a foothold and end up affecting production and product quality, just like Eric Wilson from the cannery talked about. Or a more common response in these systems is that growers will replace the beneficial predators that we used to have on the site, but destroyed, with herbicides. Now let's turn to the soil matrix. Similarly to the soil surface, tillage disrupts the balance of beneficials versus bad pests here as well, leaving the plants weakened and more susceptible to disease pressure. And tillage destroys that network of fungal populations in the near surface environment, favoring instead the bacteria that are known to be very inefficient at mobilizing nutrients and processing the carbon that's in that near surface soil matrix. For the vegetable grower, the end result is a less native nutrient supply, a weaker and less productive plant, higher costs in fertilization, irrigation, pesticide application, lower yields, stress plants, and lower quality food. In the matrix, repeated tillage breaks up those soil aggregates, leaving aggregate-based organisms like the fungal communities homeless, without a steady food supply, and unable to establish solid relationships with plant roots to aid the plant in the scavenging delivery of nutrients to that plant. Repeated turning of the soil also creates a highly oxygenated soil environment favorable to the rapid decomposition of soil organic matter that's critical to the storage and retention of soil moisture. The result is a tillage-induced drought effect in the matrix and devolution of large quantities of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere and decreasing food sources and energy for the soil microbial community. So the last control point is the rhizosphere. This is that mineral soil environment immediately surrounding all of the plant roots. The plant soil life soil connection is at its absolute peak here. It's the place where the soil house is built, where most of the plant based carbon is introduced into the soil system, and where soil life is most impacted by above ground soil management activities. Upwards of 70% of the photosynthetically derived carbon in our systems is delivered to the soil at the rhizosphere. The soil life community accepts this carbon as payment for the job that they do building and maintaining a soil environment that's suitable for plant production and reproduction. The more diverse the biology within the rhizosphere, the more stable the soil environment. Without a diverse, strong soil biological community doing its work of breaking down carbon, mineralizing nutrients, and scavenging water for plant uptake, the plant is weakened and unable to deliver sufficient supplies of sugar and enzymes that feed the soil life. In response, the plant root network inevitably contracts, leaving larger and larger areas of the soil environment without the benefit of active populations of soil microorganisms going about the work of creating and maintaining the soil house. So let's wrap up now, reviewing Scott Park's secrets to soil management success. The secret is simple, yet yeah, really it's brilliant. It's taking care of the soil that makes them more money and causes them less problems. In his system, Scott gives back to the soil what he takes, mostly in the form of seed and maintenance inputs that are friendly to the soil life. Scott doesn't argue with his customers. 
His mission is to build the healthiest plant possible by giving the soil what it needs. If he does that, everything else seems to take care of itself, including his business, his people, even his cannery manager, Eric Wilson. Scott has learned that 21st century soil management is all about mimicking nature's processes, not conquering them wherever possible. So in today's talk, I've introduced you to Scott Park, his business model, and the success that Scott has had in managing the soils for profit and the environment. And I've tried to give you insight into how soils work with a focus on the control points within the soil system where that soil food web is most active. There are three things I wish to leave you in this area. The first is that soil organisms take actions that are in their own best interests, but these actions always are within the context of the building and maintaining of the soil system in a dynamic equilibrium as a whole. In this way, the soil life is just an extension of an entire ecological frame, starting with the energy source, the sun, which all the way down to the smallest protozoa residing at the root. I also want you to remember that soil organisms find niches that allow them to successfully compete with energy and resources. Every organism in the soil food web contributes a service of some kind to the system as a whole. And lastly, the soil is an extension of the whole living system, with the soil surface, the soil matrix, and the rhizosphere being those key control centers for soil function. All right, folks, uh, and I am now back live uh, to, to finish this off here. And I, I do want to um, really encourage you all to go and take a look at the two videos. I believe both of them are now in the chat for links. And um, if not, you can always reach out and we'll get them to you. Um, in, the, in the video with Scott, um, it's one of my, uh, it's probably one of the greatest experiences I have had uh, professionally working with Scott, uh, worked with him a, a couple of years before I even produced that video. And uh, trust me, I learned so much more from him than uh, he did from me. But I, I, I emphasize it because also that video um, shows the reality of, of um, the world of farming uh, in that it represents- Jim, you are muted. Can you check? I should be on. Can you hear me? Menender. Yes, we you can. are good. Yep, yep, yes. all good. Thank you. Sorry for that. Okay. Well, what I was going to finish on, on saying on about the video was that um, it, it really represents what the, the world of agriculture really is about. Um, it, it, it represents myself as the conservationist, the people, of course, from my agency that work with Scott. Uh, but it also represents, represents the farmer and the reality of their situation. They always need to be um, keeping their eye on the bottom line. But Scott is probably a bit unique in that he also uh, has uh, companion views right along with it that he needs to make sure that his farming activities are uh, sustainable. Uh, he has that ethic built into him. And he also recognizes that, that sustainability is actually a profit motivator for him. Uh, it separates him from many of the other farmers in the area, unfortunately. Uh, for one, but he also produces a product that you, uh, you know, you hear straight from the canner in that video, um, the, the gentleman that's buying his product, uh, Eric Wilson wants to buy Scott Park's tomatoes. Uh, Eric Wilson doesn't necessarily want to buy the tomatoes that the fella next to Scott produces, but of course he has um, production targets uh, for making ketchup and things, and so he's going to do that. But what he wants is, is the best quality product. And that's what Scott delivers uh, through the conservation measures that he talked about in the video. Really a great example of, of how it really works. And I'm, again, very proud of that. So this last slide is, is just to kind of close us out uh, for the talk today. And, and I guess the way I want to conclude is, look, there's, 
there's a lot of different ways in which we can measure the success in managing our lands. And, and I accept that. I've been working with people across this country, uh, farmers, ranchers uh, for 30 plus years. And I've seen most everything there probably is to see. Uh, from my perspective, managing for the attributes that you see here on the right uh, related to uh, uh, reducing erosion loss rates, um, you know, managing for air and water permeability being optimized for the site, uh, a lack of soil crust, minimum fertilizer inputs only for maintenance purposes for what you are taking off the site, carbon cycling uh, through the use of diverse crop rotations, high microbial biomass counts and other biological measures of success in our soils, the absence of pest pressures. Um, these are the metrics that we as the soils geek uh, use to measure success. And I'm not saying that those are how other people look at it. Uh, Scott certainly doesn't look at it just like that, but he, it is part of his frame. So in my mind, there's no question that in after 70 years or so, you know, since World War II, we've been in the, the what we uh, in the agricultural world refer to as the, uh, the chemical um, agricultural uh, paradigm. Uh, after 70 years of trying that and experimenting with how it works uh, across, you know, the millions of acres of land in this country and throughout the world, to me, the evidence is, is really overwhelmingly clear when we look at our soils and how they behave now as perhaps uh, compared to uh, reference situations uh, that we talked about earlier. And that um, what we see, I think, is it, when we manage uh, our soils, uh, to, not to work them, but to get them to work and to work with them uh, and to work with them in the context of making sure that we create and maintain as strong a soil food web as we possibly can, that we have diversity within our, within our systems and that we're using compensatory and regenerative management practice techniques. In the end, I think, this is the approach that makes sense for making soils work. Um, to me, uh, the evidence is pretty clear that overall, in the end, it costs less to manage our soils sustainably. Uh, it creates a lot less problems. Uh, it's better for the environment and it produces healthier food, uh, cleaner air and water, and it's just generally more sustainable. And to me, uh, you know, that's the win that I think we are all should be sharing and, and uh, heading to as we, as we proceed with agriculture in the 21st century. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, here's my contact information again. I really appreciate your enduring some of the difficulties of the buffering on the videos in particular. And uh, again, uh, we have the links in the chat feature. And uh, now uh, we'll close with uh, my disclosure statements from USDA and we'll turn it back to Menender for the question and answer period. Thank you again. Thank you, Jim. Uh, can you move to the next screen? Okay.